I bring you greetings in the spirit of this Zonal Convocation 2019. Today's gathering, beloved, is a stirring testament of God's sustaining love. Would you agree with me? Our theme, Give Me This Mountain, reminds us that no matter the difficulties before us, we can conquer with Jesus. What do you say? In fact, the journey that brought us here has not been easy. But one thing is certain, our God is good. There were speed bumps and detours, potholes and sometimes roadblocks. But the God of the remnant church safely navigated this ship of Zion. And here we are today raising our Ebenezer to God. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. May I use this opportunity in this greeting and welcome to pay tribute to our dear members. You who made today possible. You whom because of your sterling contribution and indelible commitment to the work and mission of the church continue to give of your best to the master. We salute you. We welcome you. Many have given time, talents, and means to ensure that this work does not suffer. To God be the glory for you. Today, I encourage you to keep the fire lit and let us finish the work in a blaze of glory by the grace of the Almighty God. Finally, thank you for accepting the challenge, Zone 4, to surmount every obstacle and to conquer every mountain. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. I call upon every one of you today to manfully nerve up and get ready for Mission 2020, the next great project of the church in Jamaica, we must play our part and we must do it well by the grace of the Almighty God. Amen. Beloved friends, may this convocation inspire you beyond your wildest dreams. May our hearts be stirred with love anew for Jesus, for his work, and for the mission of the church. May we leave today recharged, re-energized, rejuvenated, and ready to take our rightful place in God's vineyard. On behalf of my family, on behalf of the members and leaders of the Mount Bay Seventh-day Adventist Church, on behalf of Zone 4, I welcome you. And as we do it in fine style, I'm going to invite the praise team to come. And I'm going to invite people everywhere to stand and just move around and greet somebody in Jesus' name as we fellowship. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Are you happy to be here this morning? Yes. If you're happy and you know it, just raise your hands and say, Praise the Lord. And thank you, Jesus. What a mighty God we serve. What do you say? We could have been dead and gone, but Jesus. Can you say amen? We could have been behind bars, but Jesus, the great liberator, has set us free. And we're happy for this glorious day, this wonderful Sabbath where God's people from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, have come to celebrate the goodness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm just excited to be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What about you? 
This is God's remnant church. And the gates of hell. And the gates of hell. Shall not prevail against the church of the living God. I want to greet you this morning. On behalf of my fellow administrators or president. Who is of the island. And he has sent his greetings in a very special way. To all of you in zone 4. And to of course our visiting speaker. And also greetings on behalf of the, uh, the Elogiles, our treasurer, and all the directors of the conference and staff at the office, I bring you greetings on their behalf. I want to say that many, many years ago, the conference thought it necessary to divide the constituency in zones. When Portland was a part of the constituency, Portland was zone five, but it's no longer with us, so we have four zones in the East Jamaica Conference of St. John Venice. We are excited about what is happening in our zones. And you see, my friends, it is very strategic that the conference has done this because the conference would not be able to meet all the needs of the people at a particular time. And so it has rightly divided the conference in zones and has placed able and capable men to lead these zones. We at East Jamaica Conference, we are very, very happy to have assigned Pastor Melvin Francis as the zone leader. Pastor Francis is more than a zone leader and he has the distinction to be called a parish coordinator because he is in charge of the parish of St. Thomas and nobody has a parish apart from Pastor um, Francis. So we are, we are very, very happy for the work that we have seen, for the togetherness, for the spiritual and the evangelistic fervency and energy that we see in this zone leader. We are asking you to continue to support the leader and his wife, his family. And we are also happy, we are also happy that we have five young dynamic pastors in this great parish, leading this parish. We had Elder Powell and Elder Simpson, these men from St. Thomas when they sat on the committee last year. And they were always crying out for help in St. Thomas because they felt that St. Thomas was kind of neglected. I don't know, but we decided that we were going to change that. And we changed it. And we have given you a leader and some strong men. Pastor, we thank you for the leadership with your men because we have seen it, we have felt it, and we want to wish you the blessings of God as you continue to lead this very dynamic zone. St. Thomas will never be the same again. Can you say amen? amen? I'd like you to put your hands together for the zone leader and the pastors in this part of the, the vineyard. This is very innovative, this mid-year convention. And it's, when I came in and I saw it, I said, we should change the name and call it Mid-Year Camp Meeting. Because, I mean, this is... Are you happy to see what is happening here? Yes. This is just excellent. Excellent. And we are happy for, for what we see. All those of you who are visitors, not members of the Adventist Church, we are happy you are here. And we know that you will receive the blessings of Jesus. I hasten on to say that this convention through the leadership has sought a very, very dynamic and respected preacher in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we are happy in the East Jamaica Conference to know, sir, that you accepted the invitation to be in the constituency of East Jamaica Conference, and in particular, in Zone 4. We remember him at our camp meeting and we thank you, sir, on that day to remind us 
that the best is yet to come. And that there's a glorious kingdom prepared for all of us. Again, welcome and greetings on behalf of this great conference. May we have a wonderful sitting as our minds are transported heavenly because soon Jesus will come and we'll see his wonderful face. God bless you. Let's have a wonderful time as we celebrate the goodness of God today. Happy Sabbath, Church of God. This morning, I am delighted to bring you greetings on behalf of Pastor Everett Brown and the other administrators at Jamaica Union Conference. I bring you their greetings as you meet in this great convocation. Last year, it was Pastor Brown who was your speaker. This year, you have a great speaker. Come on, say amen. amen. I'll say a little more about that. But I bring you greetings on behalf of the administration of the union and uh, thank you for the work that you have been doing here in this part of the vineyard. I am pleased to tell you that uh, over the, so far this year we have baptized approximately uh, 6,200 souls. Somebody didn't hear me. The Bible says there is joy in heaven over one. I am happy to tell you that so far this year in, in our union, we have baptized over 6,200 souls. Amen. Let the church say amen. amen. And we praise God for his leading. Yes. And Pastor Williams, the great news of it is that here in East Jamaica Conference, uh, the brethren have baptized over 1,500, almost 1,600 souls. And we said to God be the glory. So the work of God is going forward. But even as we baptize the thousands. We are conscious that there are many more. Hundreds of thousands who need to come to know Jesus. Against this background I want to salute and commend. The administrators of the conference. I want to salute and commend the zone leader. And all the individuals who are responsible for this great convocation. It reminds us as to why we are here. We are here to make disciples in preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. And it is to this end that we are gathered. We want to reflect on how God has led us. And we want to place ourselves in his hands for a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. You have chosen a very powerful theme for this convocation. Give me this mountain. Words uttered by, uttered by a stalwart in God's kingdom, an Israelite. And I pray that it will be the sentiment of the hearts of all of us. So greetings, greetings. And I pray that God will bless you and equip you and empower you and use you mightily. Needless to say, you have chosen an outstanding speaker. Needless to say, you have chosen a great speaker. Needless to say, you have chosen one of the best speakers that you could find anywhere in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. A man that I have come to know and respect. Many years ago, I had the privilege of sitting at his feet. He was my teacher. I taught in the master's program from, Northern, from uh, Andrews University. And as I sat, I have had many teachers but this man has endeared himself to me as a scholar par excellence. An outstanding a pastor. He served as a pastor of the church. Served as a lecturer. So he has served as an academician. Serving as an administrator. Has a broad grasp of what the work demands. And what is required at this time. My brothers and sisters, Dr. Clifford Jones, an outstanding servant of God, is here to share the word of God. You have heard about him in the week. You have listened to him. And today, you can say he is a servant of God. I ask that you open your hearts as he presents the word. I pray that God will use him. God will equip him and empower him. And that each one of us will open our hearts. As he comes to share the word of God. If it is your prayer to join this morning in saying, God, pray. We are praying for your servant. Raise your hand. Thank you. 
And I am confident that just that the Lord will use him mightily to bless our hearts. Just before the servant of God comes to present the word of God, the mass choir will bless our hearts. Thereafter, the man of God will share the word of God. May God bless you as you listen to the word. Amen and amen. What a joy. What a joy. What a joy. And what a privilege to be in the house of God today. On this the day that God hath made. A day in which we're going to rejoice and be glad. I bring to you greetings from the Lake Region Conference of Seventh-day Adventists where I'm privileged and blessed to serve covering the states of Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and we have a church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We thank God for the opportunity to serve. Incidentally, GC 2020 will be taking place in our territory, Indianapolis, Indiana. Two and a half hours from where I live. And so we look forward to greeting the saints from around the world. As they converge on Indianapolis which is called the Circle City. Indiana calls itself the crossroads of America. And so in the Circle City at the crossroads of America. The next, the next quinquennial session of our church will convene and we look forward to the deluge of Adventists worldwide that will fall or descend on Indianapolis, Indiana. We're glad. We're glad to be hosts. So God is good. I declare that God is good. All the time. Well, it is 1245. 1245. 1245. 1245. I forgot to ask the preacher what time service ends. Amen. See, I'm reminded of this preacher who being a guest preacher as I am today, before he got up, he leaned over and he asked the host, can I preach for as long as I want? And the host pastor said to him, yeah, you can preach for as long as you want. But let me hasten to add, we leave at 12.
So I don't ask, can I preach for as long as I want? I ask, what time do the saints leave? So that hopefully I'll be through before you leave. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But I try not to be long-winded. I've been in ministry now, been preaching for 40 years, Elder. Started in 1979. And my preaching has been governed all these years, Pastor, by what we call the preacher's beatitude, which is, blessed is he who preaches a short sermon, for he shall be asked to preach again. If you have your Bibles, Psalm 11th Division, verse 3, just one passage of Scripture. If the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? Father God, as we open your word, may we also open our hearts, we pray. Amen. I want to begin today by saying that no builder worth his pay or concerned about his reputation, church, will attempt to erect any structure on a shaky, unsafe foundation. The substructure of any edifice is as vital and important as the superstructure, for on it rests both the live and dead weights of everything above it. Foundations, therefore, should be strong. Should be what, everybody? They should be stable, and they should be secure. A shaky foundation makes for an unstable structure. As in the material world, so in the immaterial, ideas and concepts and institutions must have solid foundations if they are to survive. What is the foundation of society? On what do civilized societies stand on principles and values like law and order? On principles and values like honesty and truthfulness and integrity and fairness and respect and equality and justice and democracy and morality and responsibility and reciprocity. Societies and cultures that do not cultivate and promulgate these values are destined for difficulty if not demise. And beloved, our history is littered with the wreckage of civilizations and governments that failed because their foundations became corroded. Say corroded everybody. Corroded beyond despair. For example, Babylon was an advanced civilization whose achievements were unrivaled, but Babylon fell. Why? Because the king of Babylon lost respect for holy things. And today, ours is a society of eroding foundations. Honesty and integrity are no longer in vogue. 
and respect for authority is an endangered species. Even God and religion are under attack. The very pillars of our culture are crumbling. Thus the question of the psalmist is far from hypothetical. The question begs or cries out for an answer. If the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? But David supplies an answer. But the Lord is still in his holy temple. He still rules from heaven. He closely watches everything that happens here on earth. Aren't you glad that God is still on the throne? Aren't you glad that God is still in control? Are you, aren't you glad that God still rules in the affairs of humankind? Have no fear. God still rules. It's comforting to know that even as we see society crumbling, that God has not deserted the righteous. Before the world crumbles, Michael will stand up. But what does crumbling foundations have to do with us Christians? I'm glad you asked. You see, the church also has foundations. I'm talking about the Christian church in particular, in general, sorry, and the Seventh day Adventist church in particular. What do you mean, preacher? Beloved, there are certain truths. There are certain truths and beliefs. There are certain tenets and doctrines that are basic and foundational to Seventh-day Adventism. Some of these are called pillars. Others are called waymarks. Still others are called landmarks. These truths have made the Seventh-day Adventist church what it is. They have made us what we are and who we are. They have set us apart as God's remnant, truth-loving people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, in 1863... When this denomination was organized, Seventh-day Adventists believed that they were a unique people who were called into being by God to fulfill a unique purpose in the time of the end. In 1908, Ellen G. White wrote, I am instructed to say to Seventh-day Adventists the world over, God has called us as a people to be a peculiar treasure unto himself. That treasure, of course, was and remains the gospel. Now, in a May 2013 article in the Adventist World, General Conference President Ted Wilson posed the question, Who are we as a unique movement? Wilson answered his question this way, We are God's remnant church. We are a unique movement. We are people of the book. We are a prophetic movement. People who believe in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. We have been called to proclaim God's incredible message of salvation through Christ and his righteousness. We need to know who we are. If we are to deliver that message with Holy Spirit power. We need to understand why we are here as an Advent movement. We need to understand our special calling from the Lord. We have the great privilege of belonging to something much larger than just another denomination or a church body. We belong to a heaven-born Advent movement that has been called by God. At the end of time, for a united purpose. Oh, beloved, do you believe that today? Do you believe that today? 
Now the truths we hold as Seventh-day Adventists were not arrived at by whim, chance, or happenstance. They resulted from much prayerful study of God's holy word. Listen again to God's servant. Selected Messages, Book 1, 206. Many people do not realize how firmly the foundation of our faith has been laid. In Testimonies to Ministers, verses, uh, pages 24 through 26, she writes, that the early pioneers would come together in prayer and study, and that they fasted often. Many tears were shed at these meetings as, as they dug for truth as precious all and laid the foundation of the church. Years later, Ellen White remarked, it is as certain that we have the truth as God lives, and Satan, with all of his hellish power, cannot change it into a lie. In 1850, she exclaimed, we have the truth. We know it. Do you believe that today? Now in vision, Ellen White saw the messages of the three angels of Revelation 14 as steps which led to a platform that was solid and immovable. She says that she saw individuals approach that platform and examine the foundation. Adventist pioneers established their beliefs on a firm foundation. The three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Y'all may not like this sermon today. This is an old-fashioned Adventist sermon. We need to hear these old-fashioned Adventist sermons every once in a while. Come on, say amen to somebody. Hmm? When we come to an Adventist church, you ought to hear an Adventist sermon. Come on. Isn't that right? You ought to hear a sermon. Hear, uh, the, the, the sermons you hear in this church, you won't be able to hear anywhere else. You see, we are Seventh-day Adventists. We have been called by God. We are a special end-time believing people. We are the remnant. Fear God. Give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. This great nation. If any man worships the beast in his image, God's wrath will be poured out upon him. Now, according to church historian Gerard Dempsey, the early pioneers tied these three messages to the law of God, the Sabbath, the sanctuary in heaven, where a work of judgment is in process, the health message, and lifestyle reform. All of the above were understood in the context of the cross. And the second coming of Jesus. It is what gave the pioneers their reason for being. And these pillars differentiated Seventh-day Adventists from other Adventist believers of the 19th century. These beliefs constituted the great foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And this is what anyone says, volume 5. She said that we should make our children. We should make our children acquainted with the great pillars of our faith. The reasons why we are Seventh-day Adventists, why we have been called as were the children of Israel to be a peculiar people, a holy nation, separate and distinct from all other people on the face of the earth. She says that we must teach them to our children until the foundations of truth have been laid broad and deep. We must teach our children. Why the Sabbath is important and not just another day of the week. We must teach our children why we live the way we do, soberly and circumspectly. We must teach our children why Jesus as our high priest is presently engaged in a work of judgment in the sanctuary of, of heaven. We must teach our children why we are God's remnant, God's special end time people. But she says that Satan will attack the foundations. She predicted that like termites, Satan would quietly yet effectively undermine and destroy the foundations of the Seventh-day Adventist church. The old waymark, she said, would be attacked. The old landmarks would be ridiculed. The old waymarks will be vilified. And Ellen White saw it beginning to happen even before she died. We have wandered away. From the old way marks. And today in many respects. 
the Seventh-day Adventist church bears more than a passing resemblance to the world. Many of our foundational truths are crumbling. The law of God we treat with neglect. The sanctuary doctrine we claim is irrelevant. Health reform is a thing of the past. Lifestyle reform we have forgotten. And the second coming has lost its vibrancy. Seventh-day Adventists of a century ago lived and preached in the context of the second coming. In our time, the doctrine of the second coming has lost its prominence. Alarmed by this fact, a former review editor wrote, if there is one thing above all others that distinguishes the Advent people of today from the Advent people of an earlier day, it is the subdued emphasis upon the immediacy of our Lord's coming. Today we tend more to hold the doctrine in abstract. That the Lord is coming, we affirm that the day of the Lord is near. We do not seem to emphasize as such. Are you listening to me? Several years ago, a Jewish rabbi by the name of Mark Tannenbaum Travel to Israel, and this is what he had to say. The greatest threat to Israel is the danger of fatigue, spiritual fatigue, brought on by the long journey and the sustained battle. Beloved, if the greatest threat to Israel then was fatigue, what is the great threat of Adventism? I submit that the great peril of Adventism is the insensitivity shown to the nearness of our Lord's return. Indeed, in the book, The Church Faces the Isms, the author states that the most dangerous ism confronting Adventism today is not atheism, not agnosticism, not congregationalism, not racism, not classism, not sexism, not ethnocentrism, not regionalism, not nationalism, not materialism, not postmodernism, not scholasticism, not even secularism. What is the greatest threat? He says the greatest threat is somnambulism. That is walking while you are asleep. In 1850, Ellen White wrote, Time! can last but a very little longer. Time is almost finished. In 1875, she said, we are near the close of time. In 1882, the servant of the Lord said, time is drawing to a close. Eternity is near. In 1889, she wrote, time is very short. And later she remarked, we are nearing the end of time. If we were near, the second coming of Jesus more than a century ago, we are certainly closer to it today. But the second coming as a foundational truth of the Seventh-day Adventist church, even though we have it in our name, we are Seventh-day Adventists. We are Seventh-day Adventists. But we emphasize the seven day. I, I see bumper stickers. The seven day is still the Sabbath. And it is. So we need to emphasize that. But we must remember our name is seven day Adventists. There ought to be an urgency about us. There ought to be an immediacy to a Lord's return. There ought to be, we ought to be working toward it. We want to see Jesus come in our lifetime. We ought to work for it. We ought to preach for it. We ought to shed that. We ought to share that. Jesus. Hmm. Then there is the matter of worship. Somebody's saying, don't go there, preacher. Don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. The devil knows how important worship is. He knows that worship, paying homage to God, is at the center and lies at the foundation of the great controversy. Satan is acutely aware of the ecclesiological significance and eschatological implications of worship. Worship is central to Adventism's self-understanding and theology. Huh? The angels of Revelation 14, a passage that is the bedrock of Adventism, 
speak to the issue of worship. Then I saw another angel flying in the midair. And hear the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, fear God. Give glory to him because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the spring of waters. Ah, a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if any man worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead, on the hand, he too will drink the wine of God's fury which hath been poured out. Full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast in his image or who receive the mark of his name. The primary message of these three angels is a call to worship. The first angel affirms that worship will be the great cosmic issue in the end time. The third angel amplifies the message of the first angel with an unambiguous warning that obedience to God goes hand in hand with worship. What did Jesus say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do what I say. Those who worship God will obey God. And those who obey God will worship God. We need to understand that worship is a way of life. We need to understand that. But make no mistake about it. What Adventists do, what we do in worship, when we worship is of significance. We cannot treat worship with indifference. Hello, somebody. Listen to Raymond Holmes, one of our theologians. Our worship is not an incidental matter that can be left to the women fancy of pastors and presidingly elders. It requires prayerful thought. It requires what, everybody? It requires prayerful thought and careful planning to create a deeply meaningful service. It also requires careful education of the congregation. It would seem then that our biblical mandate requires Adventist worship to be distinctive. While we share many liturgical traditions with other denominations, our worship ought not be identical with theirs. The mission of the Seventh Adventist Church must be made audible and visible in its worship services thereby reflecting the distinctive doctrines we hold to be essential and vital. Are you listening to me out there? While our churches are moving in the direction of similarity in liturgy, thus illustrating commonly held beliefs, we must respond more fully to the first angel's message of Revelation 14 and move in the distinction of uh, direction of liturgical distinctiveness. In this way, the contrast between Adventism and other churches will be more apt apparent and our worship will contribute to the incisiveness of the eternal gospel we are called to preach he goes on if it is true that an enemy is trying to destroy the sacredness of christian worship we need to do something about it contentment with confusion meaninglessness and immaturity will not defeat it this enemy neither will the answer be found in an uncritical acceptance of the procedures of some other churches we are adventists we are adventists and we must approach worship as adventists a worship service that meets the needs of Methodists and Episcopalians and even Presbyterians may be unsatisfactory for us. The answer will be found in a thorough knowledge of the biblical, theological, and historical aspects of Christian worship and a thoughtful application of this knowledge to Adventist worship today. These theologians say that in too many of our churches, Worship is religious entertainment. A mismatch and a hodgepodge. A Sabbath morning minstrel show. Pastoral prancing. And theatrics. It all adds up to what they call liturgical litter. Liturgical litter. Which he defines homes as worship services that have been planned with little or no theological reflection on the meaning. 
Hmm? He believes that every time we come to worship, three, the three distinctives of Adventism should be emphasized. The Sabbath, the sanctuary, and the second coming. The three S's, Sabbath, sanctuary, second coming. Hmm? You all get mighty quiet out there. If you can't say amen, say ouch. Even sin seems to have vanished from our presence. We're talking about the foundations now. Over three, over, uh, three uh, decades ago, a Christian psychiatrist named Dr. Carl Menninger published a book with a hauntingly probing title, Whatever Became of Sin. Whatever Became of Sin. In it, he bemoaned the absence of the word from our contemporary vocabulary. He was picking up on a concern of Paul Tillich, who earlier had asked, have the men of our time lost a feeling of the meaning of sin? Our vocabulary has been amended. Old-fashioned sin is out. We today talk in terms of shortcomings and issues. Everybody has issues. Nobody sins anymore. We recoil, we cringe at even using synonyms for sin. We prefer to use euphemisms. Thus we engage in antisocial behavior, not sin. We may be guilty of unethical behavior, but not sin. Nobody sins anymore. You see, we are now an enlightened people, a progressive people, a thinking people, a reasoning people, an educated people, a sophisticated people. We got MDs and JDs and PhDs and EDDs, we know better. We are educated. Yeah. Ellen White says that sin is becoming more bold and defiant as intellectual knowledge and acuteness are acquired. Nobody sins anymore. Hmm. Ah, uh, but we would, we would need to know, or we need not lose sight of. As Ellen White says, God's hatred of sin is as strong as death. But she quickens to add his love for the sinner is stronger than death. Where sin doth abound, grace that much more abound. Can somebody say amen? amen? Oh, beloved, I just stopped by today to remind you, to remind us all that we need to hold on to the foundations. Can I hear somebody say amen? amen. The prophet Isaiah says, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the beach, breach, the restorer of past to dwell in. Ellen White says we have wandered away from the old landmarks. Let us return. If the Lord be God, serve him. If Baal, serve him. Which side will you be on? Elsewhere she says, we are God's commandment keeping people. The old waymarks which have made us what we are, are to be preserved. God calls upon us to hold on to them firmly with the grip of faith. We must hold on to the fundamental principles that are based upon unquestionable authority. The old man and the wise man Solomon declared, there is a way 
that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the words, ways of death. We must give the bugle a certain sound. Watchman, I have set thee upon the walls. Cry aloud. In Revelation 18, John hears the angel crying, Babylon, Babylon is fallen. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. God is calling upon us to reestablish the old way marks in our homes, in our lives, in our churches. God is calling us to return to primitive godliness, to get back to basics, to rekindle the old time religion, the old truths, the old standards, the old landmarks, the old way marks. What was wrong back then is still wrong today. What was right back then is still right today. Do I hear somebody saying, give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It was good for the prophet Samuel. It was good for the prophet Daniel. Good for the apostle Paul. Good for my old mama. Good for my old papa. Good for my old grandma. Then it's good enough for me. If the foundations be destroyed, then what will the righteous do? The apostle Paul responds, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builder thereon. But let every man take heed how he build it thereon. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Ah, uh, we just talked about all landmarks and waymarks and pillars. But at the end of the day, the foundation that we have as a church is Jesus Christ the righteous. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus. No wonder the hymn writer said, the church has one foundation. Tis Jesus Christ her Lord. And it was Christ himself who declared upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Beloved, all of our standards, all of our doctrine, all of our beliefs, all of our landmarks, all of our pillars are anchored I anchored, I anchored, I anchored in Jesus Christ the righteous. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Jesus Christ is our foundation. The center of every doctrine that we Adventists hold. Christ is the truth about God. Mm, he is the truth about God. He is God's word incarnate. Before Abraham was, I am, he declared. In Christ was and is life unborrowed, original, and underived. Christ is the truth about my salvation. He is the truth about the sanctuary. And he is the truth about the judgment. I am come that they may have life. And that they may have it more abundantly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Christ is the truth about the resurrection. Every funeral Christ ever attended he broke up including his own. He is the death of death. When he died, death died. I said, when he died, death died. And if you don't believe me, i lead you to an empty grave. Jesus Christ turned death from an eternal nightmare into an afternoon siesta. And now he lives. 
ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. Now he lives as my mediator, evermore making intercession for me. Now he lives, the second Adam, my righteousness by faith. Now he lives, my presiding judge, my show defense, the one who rules in favor of the saints. Now he lives, my reconciler, my ransom, my surety, my atonement, my justification, my sanctification, my, my glorification. Now he lives, establishing my right to the tree of life. But Christ is also the truth about heaven. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Soon I'll be done with the troubles of this world. Trouble don't last always. You see, weeping may endure for a night, but joy, real joy, ah, holy joy comes in the morning. We're going home, we're going home. No more wheelchairs. Rocking chairs, dental chairs, or electric chairs. We're going home. The lion and the lamb will lie down together. And a little child shall lead them. We are going home. The sun will not smite thee there. For there will be no need of the sun. For he will give them light. We're going home. Flowers will bloom. The crooked places will be made straight. And the rough places will be made smooth. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. We're going home. Streets of gold. Walls of jasper. A tree with 12 men of fruit for the healing of the nations. We're going home. No more sickness. No more tears. No more death. We're going home. While in vision, the apostle John, there on the Isle of Patmos, heard the angel asking, how long, O Lord? How long? I stopped by to tell you how long? Not long. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. We are Seventh-day Adventists. How long? Not long. The golden morning is fast approaching. Jesus soon will come. How long? Not long. Lo, he comes. He comes victorious, glorious. Jesus comes to reign victorious. How long? Not long. Lift up the trumpet. Loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. How long? Not long. We have this hope. That burns within us. Hope in the coming of the Lord. How long? Not long. Hail him, hail him. Jesus, our blessed redeemer. How long? Not long. Face to face shall I behold him. Face to face when shall it be? How long? Not long. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. How long? Not long. Jesus. 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 Is coming again. And that is why today. I stake my claim with Jesus. I'll follow him. I rest my case on Jesus. At the cross, we see mercy at its best. At the cross, mercy is grace and grace is free. At the cross, the dying thief tells my story and registers my grief. Lord, when thou comest in thy kingdom, remember me. Remember me, O oh Jesus, in mercy, Lord. Remember me. And beloved, one of these days, 
one of these days when it's all over when the morning comes I shall see him in the fullness of his splendor I shall see him over in Beulah land when time like a weary traveler rests its tired head on the bosom of eternity. I shall see him and sing the song of Moses and the Lamb and tell the story of how I overcame all over God's temple. I say saved by grace, spared by mercy. At the walls of Jasper, Saved by grace, spared by mercy. Around the great white throne. Saved by grace, spared by mercy. At the banquet table. Saved by grace, spared by mercy. At the tree of life. Saved by grace, spared by mercy. At the feet. Of Jesus. Saved by grace. Spared by mercy. As I put on my long white robe. Saved by grace. Spared by mercy. As I put on my golden shoes. Saved by grace. Spared by mercy. As they put my crown on my head. Saved by grace. Spared by mercy. As I walk all over God's heaven. Saved by grace. Spared by mercy. What a day. What a day. What a day. Of rejoicing. That will be. Pastor you said it earlier. I'll say it again. On that day my passions will be purified. And my problems will be rectified. And my sins will be mortified. And my sorrows will be cast aside. And my status will be clarified. And my testimony will be amplified. And my pains will be pacified. And my goals will be prioritized. And my faith will be verified. And my purpose will be clarified. And my devotion will be intensified. My joy will be multiplied. My values will be magnified. My praise, my praise, my praise, my praise, my praise will be amplified. And my needs will be glorified, satisfied. My soul satisfy and my being my being my being glorify even so even so come Lord Jesus it's almost time was Seventh-day Adventist. Seventh-day Adventist. Seventh-day Adventist. A special people with a special mission. We ought not be embarrassed about who we are. I used to tell the preachers who came to the seminary, I 
for them sometimes they would be trying to sound like somebody else. T.D. Jakes and these first day preachers. I said, listen, T.D. Jakes can't preach what you've been called to preach. Huh? And when the saints come to an Adventist church, they ought to hear an Adventist sermon. If when I come to an Adventist church, I don't hear an Adventist sermon, then I don't need to come. I can go to the first day church. And those first day boys can out preach us with first day stuff than we can. We ought not even try to match him. We have a special message. We ought not be embarrassed about it. God has called us. For such a time as this. Who believes God's word today? If you do stand to your feet. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Father God, thank you for this holy convocation. Thank you for the planners and for the conveners. Thank you for the saints of this zone, zone four. Thank you for the passion they still have for evangelism. Continue to abide with us, keep us faithful. Keep us focused. Keep our eyes stayed on Jesus. We give you the praise. We give you the honor. And we give you the glory. Let all of God's people say, Amen. All right, we have in the pool at this time a young lady, a child. Daniel Tracy. And where are you from, Daniel? Trinityville. She's from Trinityville. And we are, we are happy for her. And I ask that you will remember her in your prayers as she grows in the Lord. And so, my dear sister in Christ, it gives us great pleasure to baptize you. And we do so because you have confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. We are happy now to bury you in this water grave of baptism. We pray in Jesus' name and the church say, Amen. Amen. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. In the water, we have Darren Braham. Give him a big praise the Lord. Lord. My brother, upon the profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. as ministers of the gospel, we now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let the people say, Amen. Amen. Born, born, born again. Thank God I'm born again. I'm very happy to present to you a newly married couple, brother and sister done. But God is not done with them yet. Can you say amen? God is not done with them yet. We're happy for you. And we wish you God's blessings as you worship together and as you enjoy living together as husband and wife. May I just say that you're beginning to look like each other. And so, my dear... Brother and sister Don, it is upon the profession okay. All right, they're requesting a song. All right, we're going to um, just stop here a little bit and ask the person or the group that is coming to give us at least one stanza, Pastor. Right. And I heard that the brethren from Woodburn are here to support them. Okay, so... Thank you very much. We are the persons who will be okay. So long they've searched for life's meaning enslaved by the world and their greed. Then the door.
Natalia Bernard McFarlane, and she's coming from the Wilmington Church. And I hear the Wilmington Virgin saying amen. amen. And we're happy for you, Talia. We wish you God's blessings as you continue this great spiritual journey. And so, my dear sister in Christ, it is upon the profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior from sin that we, as ministers of the gospel, now baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the blessed Holy Spirit and the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Won't it be a time when we get over yonder? Won't it be a time? And in the interest of time, I'll just say that I have known Miss Josephs for over 20 years. First as her teacher and now as a work colleague. I know that as happy as I am, I am today, heaven is even happier. And I am very proud of her. Congratulations. Medoria, Joseph, we are proud and happy for you. And so, Sister Joseph, because of your love for the Lord Jesus Christ and your faith in him as ministers of the gospel, we now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, let the people say, Amen. I'm going to walk the streets of glory by and by, by and by. I'm going to walk the streets of glory by and by, by and by. In the water we have Sister Alia Ford. She has decided to commit her life to Jesus. And we know that there is joy in heaven. For the Bible says that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents than 99 just persons who need no repentance. And today we are rejoicing with her. Can I hear you say amen? amen. We want to thank God for those persons who have worked with her. Amen. Now our prayers are, Sister Ford, that God will bless you and that you'll become an inspiration to others as they take their stand for Jesus. And so, my dear sister, because you love Jesus and desire to walk with him, we now, as ministers of the gospel, baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the blessed Holy Spirit. And let everybody say, Amen. I'm not on a ego trip. I'm nothing on my own. I may we have miss Marcia you. Bailey in the pool at this time. And Marcia is from the Morant Bay Church. This is where she will worship. Do I hear Morant Bay saying amen? Yes. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Marcia, as you take this profound step as you surrender your life to Jesus. And so, my dear sister Bailey, it is upon the profession of your faith and your love for Jesus Christ as your Savior that we as ministers of the gospel now baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of his Son, Jesus, and the name of the Holy Spirit, Holy Comforter, let the church of the living God say, Amen. amen. When amen. I get there, when I get there, I'm going to sing and shout, when I Water, we have Sister Val Rose Mattis. She has decided to recommit her life to Jesus. Let the church say amen. amen. We are rejoicing with you, Sister Mattis. And we know that God will not fail you. Amen. He will strengthen you and he will bless you. The Lord. And he will take care of the past and he will give you a bright future. Amen. And so because you love Jesus and desire to recommit your life to him, we now, as ministers of the gospel, baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the blessed Holy Spirit, and let everybody say, Amen. Amen. If you know the Lord is keeping you, why worry about? If you know the Lord is keeping you. We have listened to a very powerful message from the servant of God. God has been using him. We have also witnessed today 
a baptismal service. And very often in a service like this, when we have heard a powerful message and we have witnessed a baptismal service, we leave and miss the point that God wants us to recommit our own lives to him and to recommit our lives to the mission to which he has called us. During class this week, Dr. Jones, I had a young man who came up to me after my class and he said, in 2008, you had a campaign. My mother invited me to the campaign. I came and I listened, but I didn't give my heart to Jesus. Two years later, I got baptized. And here I am now studying for the ministry. Anytime we come together like this, God wants to save somebody. And after this message and after this baptismal service, Pastor Williams, we would not like one person to leave here without making a commitment to follow Jesus. And I just want to ask in the closing moments of this service, is there one person inside this church or on the outside who is not yet baptized and you want to say, Pastor, pray for me? That by God's grace, I'll make that commitment. Is there one person not yet baptized? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Is there one inside or outside? God bless you, my sister. Is there another? You are not ashamed. Jesus says, if you are ashamed to own me before men, I'll be ashamed to own you before my father. Under the tent, is there somebody not yet committed to Jesus in baptism and you want to say, Pastor, pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. For by God's grace, I want to be saved. Pray for me. Is there one more? Is there one more? We pray for those who answered the call today. And Father, we lift up these calls of folk who came forward on behalf of somebody else. A husband, a wife, a child. A grandchild, a neighbor, a co-worker, a relative, a friend. Oh God, honor their faith today we pray. Honor their faith, increase their faith. And Lord, remind us, I pray that you may have a special blessing for this zone. Bless the zone leader. Bless every pastor in this zone, oh God, we pray. Then bless every zone in this conference. Bless the conference leadership. The president who may be away today but is here in spirit. Then we pray for blessings upon the union. If we never meet like this again. If I never meet my brothers and sisters here. Keep us until that day we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let all of God's people say, amen. amen, and amen, and amen, amen.